Hello, and welcome to day three of Seattle Pacific University's Days of Common Learning. Today's topic is jobs of tomorrow. Digital transformation and of the workplace is part of the fourth industrial revolution. It is changing both how we work and what skills are in demand in the workforce. More change is coming ahead. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has also fast-tracked a lot of these changes as many of us have moved to working from home and online. Today, we're going to discuss the role of government in some of these changes, the roles of us as educators, how we each individually need to prepare and plan for our futures, and how digital transformation might evolve work into a more fulfilling and transformative endeavor. Now I'd like to welcome our dynamic panel. We're excited to learn from all of your diverse experiences and perspectives on this topic. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carlos Arias. Hello, everybody. And next, Kim Blue, a senior HR manager at Microsoft. Hello, everyone. And Tansy Brook, director of ERP, EPM, and cross SaaS product marketing at Oracle. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Micah. Glad to be here. And finally, Lewis McMurrin, co-manager of the Future of Work Project for Washington State's Workforce Training and Education Coordinating Board. Thanks, Micah. It's great to be here. Looking forward to it. We'll have some Q&A, so remember to ask questions in the side, vote up uh, questions that you'd like to get answered, and we'll incorporate those into our discussion or try and address them at the end. I'd like to begin our conversation today by reading the opening paragraph from the Future of Work Task Force Policy Report. Self-driving cars, cashierless checkout, algorithms that perform the tasks of lawyers, accountants, journalists, musicians, and personal assistants, robots and software programs fueled by advances in artificial intelligence are becoming increasingly proficient at performing an array of tasks more efficiently and more accurately than the humans who created them. The collection and analysis of dizzying volumes of data is providing new ways to conduct business and even understand human behavior. Whew, that's amazing. Um, one of the domains of science, once the domain of science fiction, new technology is dramatically reshaping our environment, the economy, and the way we live. While the nature of many jobs will change and others will be relegated to the dustbin of history, new jobs will also be created. As in past periods of technological upheaval, the introduction of new technology into our lives has engendered reactions of fear and resentment, as well as hope and optimism for the possibilities of what may come. What makes this new fourth industrial revolution different is the pace of change is much faster and more widespread than in previous periods of technological upheaval. So as we begin to think about this topic, one of the, the things that I found most profound when I was reading through Klaus Schwab's book on the fourth industrial revolution was that many Silicon Valley companies are delivering 10 times the revenue per employee compared to more traditional firms. Much of this is due to the heavy use of modern technology and automation. So as we think about what it means for the broader economy, what industries do we think will be most impacted by automation and te technological disruption? And I'd like to start with uh, Lewis to, to sort of frame his research into this for Washington State. Thanks, Micah. I really appreciate the um, quoting of the report here. And there's no doubt that this was um, a very interesting project. And I'll just put a little bit of perspective around it. Uh, Washington State passed legislation in 2018 that created the very first future of work task force in the nation. Other states have followed suit, but we were the first state in the union to do this and to create a, a legislatively um, a created task force around it. So the research that we have found and that we did, again, a lot of it is well known, it's out there you know, in, in the ether, if you will, uh, about the change of jobs, the, 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 the pace of advanced technology, and now we have a, a pandemic that has accelerated this future of work right into our present day labs. 
I'm looking forward to, again, I'm happy to provide advice, answer questions. But what I would say is that number one, we can't predict anything, right? It is, if there's one thing that we know is that we can't predict the future. Um, every industry is going to be facing new levels of automation and change, even the tech industry itself, even coding and programming itself is going to go through automation. So you're also, what I think you're going to see as well too, is a lot of automation related to health and safety and things like uh, cleaning of airplanes, cleaning of escalators, uh, building, uh, building cleaning. A lot of new technology is going to get deployed that looks automated, but may not necessarily displace a job as well too. There's a lot of nuances here uh, and there's a lot to discuss. So I'll let the other panelists go. Would anybody else like to chime in? Well, moving into our next question, um, this is accelerated a bit with the recent pandemic. And Kim, you've been a bit on the front lines of this working in HR. How have you seen COVID-19 and the pandemic accelerate some of these labor market changes? So I think that that's a great question. And I will tell you as someone who does sit at the front lines of this, um, the conversations that were already happening in the technology industry were very much centered around the digital transformation, the adoption of new product, the adoption of um, and, and integration of how we look to ensure that we have enough diverse features and um, ways of ensuring that we can customize this for not only partners, but industries that there had never um, been major presence in. And with the um, onset of COVID, there's had to be a much more rapid rate of not only adoption, but the creation of new technologies and new systems and processes so that not only can the adoption of it be quick, but ultimately it is impacting the way that we live, work and play. And so we've had to kind of build the plane while we're flying it, if, if that makes any sense to anyone, right? And so what we're finding is, is that in real time, we're having to create, you know, platforms, product, get the feedback about it, make adjustments to that in real time while we're also redeploying that, but we're also having to be very particular about everything from how we list job skills and capabilities to the way that we're even marketing to um, talent that's out there and where we are putting our footprint down. And, and I say that certainly not just as um, you know a member of my current organization, but as I look across um, HR as an industry, right? We're having to really get creative and innovative and be that critical partner at the table um, as we are coaching and leveraging um, ways to help our leaders think differently about what the future of work looks like. I think one thing that's a, a positive side of this is really this focus on rethinking what work looks like um, and focusing a lot on flexibility. Um, I think, um, I believe that this idea of work balance um, is actually an outdated concept. There's a lot more about work-life integration. And I think this is really giving us an opportunity to so sort of explore what lo work looks like, how we do work, um, exploring different tools that allow us to connect with each other in remote ways, um, and even rethink about where we're pulling talent from. Like I'm based in Silicon Valley and traditionally um, a lot of companies wanted to hire from here, but um, increasingly there's considerations in terms of looking outside of some of the major tech hotspots to other um, talent pools, which I think is a great opportunity because if work can be remote and you can find ways to connect with people um, and get things done, um, how might we reconsider um, things that we've taken for granted in terms of um, talent and um, the, the necessity to be located together um, moving forward? Um, and I think also a focus on um, technology that you don't have to be on site to use, like um, the technology that, that we work with. Um, my company sells um, cloud-based products. And one of the things that we've seen a lot is that companies who don't have to have their technology on site with them, things that they can do more remote, makes it a lot easier for them to do their work when you can't have people going into the office. And so I'm um, sort of rethinking access to these systems and, and how we do work as well. So if I may add one additional point, I think, um, 
you know, what was just said is so profound in particular around just the industry diversity, right? And understanding that the talent that you may have commonly sourced from, you know, purely technology, now you may need to look at, you know, finance tech or retail or academia or, you know, healthcare. There is credible and valuable talent out there as we're looking at building these products and, you know, having to be able to say, well, maybe we don't do this on site or maybe we don't have to have this technology with us or this particular set of products with us. Um, and being able to leverage that as an opportunity to say to people, not only do we want diverse talent and we want to be able to diversify the industry, but we want to diversify the way that we've been working as well and, and using that as a, as a tool to be able to, to help expand you know your own perspective around what you've always done versus how you embrace these new changes in terms of the world of work Kim I think that's very that's very critical it's it's this mindset issue right and as somebody who again uh, as you can see a little bit of gray hair it's really important for those of us with some wisdom to also stay out of our comfort zones and be able to pass that knowledge along. I mean, it's really encouraging. Finally, again, I, I represented the tech industry in Olympia for 13 years. So I've worked with Microsoft and Amazon and these companies. And now, finally, that mindset, even among those that are supposed to be big thinkers, is changing around particularly the talent and the equity implications of that, right? So it's it's really encouraging to hear because leaders, I mean, lot, most of us are all flying blind, right, right now. I mean, you know, the young people listening, folks, we don't know everything or even anything right now. So this is an opportunity to really work together to create something new because we have to, right? This is one of those necessity is the mother of invention situations. Right. To continue on that same idea, I would like to add that uh, the whole pandemic and the whole technological change creates new opportunities. Um, there are many people who have been flexible enough to create new services that may be we're not working as much before. Uh, for instance, in my country, in Honduras, suddenly delivering anything become a business. Uh, delivering food, delivering groceries, because people could not go to the supermarket. Uh, the same Zoom technology that we're using, it boomed out, okay? And there can be many other things that can be there. And we just, like everybody else was saying, open our minds and uh, collaborate with people outside of our usual niche. Thank you, everyone. Uh, one of the things that I see in this as well is as, as remote work becomes more possible, some of that spreading of economic wealth is possible. So we're not tied up with labor stuck in the tech hubs of say Seattle and, and uh, Silicon Valley. There's an opportunity to spread the economic wealth across the nation to more diverse populations and also enable more diverse hires that have never been possible before and in new and different ways. So as I consider that on a global scale, 17% of the world still lacks electricity and therefore has yet to experience the, the metaphorical second industrial revolution. Is there a point as we think on that scale where we need to start becoming concerned that the economic gaps and disparity between nations and regions around the world will become so vast that, that folks can never catch up. I think it's definitely a concern, um, but I also think that um, com countries, let's just for the sake of, um, for sake of discussion, talk about countries. Um, as countries move forward and develop new technologies, um, as other um, co um, countries come online, they're able to actually leapfrog and use those technologies. So for example, in Africa, uh, there's a lot of people who have cell phones who don't have electricity. Um, and in many ways, they've had access to new opportunities and access to technology and not having to go through all of the stages that previous countries did. So I think that's definitely a concern, but I think there are also opportunities in terms of um, as we share more ideas and share more innovation um, as a world, there's opportunities to sort of accelerate the catching up that different countries can do. Um, you know, um, Micah, it's interesting. I mean, 17%, you know, that's not a technology problem. I mean, that, that's a political problem. That means the countries in which those people live, the, the, 
there has not been enough political will to bring electricity to those people, right? It's not that technology for electricity doesn't exist. That is an issue how to properly to deal with resources. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hoping though, I mean, this is again, the province of economies like our own and a pandemic is a good time where I'm hoping a lot of us have rethought our own consumption patterns. And I think in you know, America is certainly the most obvious of the consumer economies. And the, I guess the question is, are, are we as a society going to make some different decisions about how we consume and what we consume that then has an, a, a, an impact around the world on, on resource production and allocation? So uh, it's an interesting question. And certainly, I mean, we're already seeing too much, already too much bifurcation between rich and poor, north and south already, uh, which has been going on for a long time. So, but again, I, I, but, but Tansy's quote about seeing countries leapfrog, right? I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these developing nations never built a copper wire system. So they actually have the opportunity in the next 10 years for them to advance are pretty good. Um, but again, a lot of it is political will, not, they're not technology problems necessarily. That's a really good point, Lewis. Um, since you brought it in that direction, what should government be doing as we head into this new era and what regulations might be necessary as we start thinking about both locally, um, nationally within the United States, but also globally, as you, as you talked about, about governmental issues around funding things like electricity in, in certain regions? I have an idea there, and just for the sake of sharing, um, I was thinking that one thing that the governments could do is create the incentives so that people would want to update themselves. So say that we move into a moment where uh, it is likely that my job is going to change. So what do I do? Do I close my arms? If I stop working, I don't eat. So how do I update myself? So maybe if there is a scholarship where I can go and instead of just receiving free money, I am forced to go and study and update myself, then that could lead to me being in the right position when the actual change happens. Now on a more global scale, uh, once again, I agree completely with you. It's a, it's a very, very complex political issue. Um, how do you promote equity between the com uh, countries that are used to just producing uh, raw material, for instance? So it's like, how do we help everybody come up to the same level? That one, I've been wondering about it for a long time. And I have no easy solution for that one. <laughs> well, uh, I'll first off, let me say that all my opinions are not of the state of Washington. They are not of my employer, the Washington Workforce Board. They are my opinions only. But those are two different questions. What should the government do? And then I forget what the second part of it was. But, but Carlos, you hit on something, a, a really important point. The one thing that we are seeing for sure right now, particularly with a lot of unemployment created by COVID and others, is the need for upskilling at scale and the need to incentivize individuals and, and employers to provide that training um, at scale again too. And I know that Oracle, Microsoft and others are really working on this. In fact, Kim, as you're probably aware, LinkedIn Learning is an all day you know, event the last two days that's been really amazing for HR leaders and, and that kind of thing. So the upskilling at scale, right? And the classic problem of those that need it don't know they need it until it's a little bit too late. So it really is, it comes down to a lot of messaging, right? I mean, it's, we've got to be messaging about the upskilling and sort of the lifelong learning. Um, and I'm sure that again, Tansy and Kim probably have better statistics than I do on employee retention for those that are trained, right? Um, there, there's become a huge benefit. And I'm really actually quite impressed with some of the private sector responses. Um, Coursera, for example, has offered free content to unemployed people in the state of Washington. I'm getting approached often by 
um, upstart startup vendors who are using AI to help people find jobs and find pathways. So there's a lot of really cool new things happening, you know, in support of workers and in support of the unemployed. Of course, the job search system needs to change because it's still very opaque and difficult and painful. And I'll, I'll let employers deal with that for the moment. But but again, the incentivizing of people to train themselves is very key. And Carlos, so you're really onto that and finding either in tax incentives, financial incentives or otherwise to get there is something that, that the government really has got to focus in on. Jim, do you want to touch on that job search system improvement and what yes. you might see there? Absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the things, um, and certainly Tansy, if you have thoughts on this, I would love to, you know, invite you to, to comment um, as well. But I, th I think one, one fundamental aspect of this process is, you know, when we think about applicant tracking systems, and we think about the way that um, companies, you know, structure their career hubs or wherever they list their information as far as what, um, not only what um, roles that they're looking for, but skills and capabilities, and then certainly the diversity of the geography that's in there. And so um, how do we use those algorithms or some of that information to ensure that we are creating you know, an, an incentive kind of upfront, meaning, wow, I don't have to leave my local um, community where my family is, where I'm established and all of that um, in order to continue to do this work. And I think that there is a push now to really look at what types of systems are out there, but then how can they be enhanced? What are the feedback mechanisms um, to talent acquisition and, and global talent communities to say, we wanna be able to put these things in place up front, but we also wanna make sure people recognize the impotence behind that, which is we wanna show you that we are incentivizing the employment in a certain way, right? Not only are you coming to work for a really fantastic organization, but right up front, we're telling you we value you in these ways. And this is how we are describing that. And this is the environment in which we're able to do that. Um, I think applicant tracking systems, um, you know, as far as they have been historically really have just been sort of, you know, about data and less about employee experience. And so if you want to be able to migrate some of that forward, there has to be a little bit of that employee experience component brought in there so that people can go along on the journey with the organization um, and, and leverage that as a means of saying, let us teach you a little bit about what's going on there to help you feel a part of the team or a part of the organization or feel valued from up front, as opposed to just being shuffled through, you know, rank and file employee who is applying for position X, waiting to go through your standard, you know, recognition and vetting, and then, you know, matching of skill sets in the process that we currently see now, right? So it, it has to evolve in the same manner, right? And, and um, I don't know that companies have the, the recipe quite yet and have figured out how to really do that, um, whether they are being incentivized or not. I just, I don't think that they've quite yet caught up to that part of how they attract talent. Um, to add on to that, I, I would say the two things that I think are exciting is a paradigm shift towards a value of lifelong learning and diversity. And I think that directly um, pertains to hiring because when pe companies know that they need to hire people, not just for the skills they have, but also for their potential. So for example, in the job that I was hired in, when I was hired, they said, look, you've got a great background, but you're gonna need to learn more about this area. Do you have an interest in that? And I was lucky that, that I was aware, I was self-aware enough. And then also they were aware enough to say, you know, you can learn this, but do you have an interest in learning it? And I think putting the focus on that, it, you know, focusing on potential and desire and people's interest in learning is something that's really important for employers. Um, the other thing that I think that's great is this idea of diversity. And when I talk about diversity, it's hiring people with different backgrounds and hiring people that don't fit into a box. I think one of the biggest problems we have in terms of the systems and the way, the way we hire people is that we want something, it's a lot easier if when we're using technology to stick them in a box. I mean, that even goes back to the automation piece. Like, how can we fit everybody in these boxes and how do we check the boxes? Well, the problem with that is that's not really what people are fundamentally to begin with. And also increasingly, that's not the type of skill sets that companies need. So you're more value to an employer if you have um, a background in multiple disciplines. 
Um, and, and often, you know, some of the best employees that I've worked with um, and, and things that I've experienced in the past is they're like, you're amazing, but we don't know where to stick you. Like we don't have a box for you. And so that's really important that um, employers are understanding that the, the skill sets and that the way they think about hiring is really important. Um, and then also in terms of how they make up the team. In the past, it was really a lot about what do we currently have? How do we duplicate that? But now there's more of a focus on how do you have, um, you know, people who are additive to the team have different perspectives, come from different backgrounds, have different skill sets, you know, all, all sorts of different, you know, all the many, um, you know, types of diversity um, are the types of things that need to be considered for teams. So I think that the good thing is that, that the philosophy shift is there. Companies are trying to figure out how to do it. The biggest problem, I think, is really a matching problem. And I think it's how do you get this great talent and how do you get to the, this great employers? Um, and I think the two things that can really help with that um, are one, um, education, because I think that's one thing um, that educational institutions can help with is how do we help find your fit? Um, the second thing I would say is employers being more aware of this and being more open-minded in terms of their hiring practices and, and trying to work on improving their systems. And the last thing I would say is the actual employees themselves. Um, these days, the, the most valuable thing you can do is be authentic. Figure out who you are, learn how to communicate who you are, because that's going to what's going to make it a lot easier for these employers to say, oh, you're actually a perfect fit for this, or this is how we need to connect you here. And so um, especially because now people have such varied skill sets um, and, and increasingly need to have those varied skill sets, um, but it doesn't really fit in the boxes that we have, the more that people are aware of um, sort of the value that they can provide and communicate that, um, I think you know, those are three different components um, that are areas that we can really focus on improvement. Yeah. I would add to that, there's a narrative around, you know, and I think Tansy is very wise to bring this up, right? This narrative around inclusion and innovation, right? And so what we're, what, what Tansy is saying is, right, so we've spent so much time talking about diversity, right? Diversity is those comfortable boxes that we spend time in, and that is algorithm, that's you know, the code, that's the way to get from A to Z in a very comfortable space in the way that we do that, right? So if diversity is the shore, right, we know where the shore begins and ends, right? The inclusion is the ocean. And that's the part that's a little bit unknown. And that's what I mean when I say I don't think organizations have quite figured out what that is, because there's a lot of discovery that has to happen there. Right, and so what we know about the ocean is that it's dark and it's big and it's wide and there's just, there's room for everybody, right? And all things, right? But we have to discover that and we have to be okay knowing that our inclusion is gonna drive our innovation strategy. And that is what is going to help shift a lot of you know, the ways that we have to start thinking differently, but also showing up differently, right? The, the minute we start to think differently is the minute the things that Tansy were talking about start to, um, you know, uh, become the dominoes that fall, right? We now start to have diversity in our thought, which helps us think differently about the way that we would hire for somebody, the skill sets and capabilities. And then maybe that gets into the geography. And then in that geography, what does our talent migration strategy look like? And then what is the technology needed to embed and bring all of that together so we can have a sustainable model going forward, right? And that's the part, right? That's the dark part of the ocean that we haven't quite figured out yet, but there's luckily, right? The pandemic has sort of pushed us into that space where we're, we're kind of being forced to work through the discomfort and swim in the dark a little bit and kind of start to figure that out. And when we figure it out, right? We kind of come to the surface and we plant something on our, sh on our shore, right? And then we swim back down again and, because there's more discovery there that has to be done. So. I, th I think going back to the original question, and, and I love how this is all tied together, right? But it's it's all going back to kind of what those needs are, and 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 what we're seeing on the front lines is as as you know, human resources professionals um, and educators around, you know, what's out there, and and how quickly, you know, not only do we need to build the plane while we're flying it, but we need to land it and, and let it take off again, right? To test out how some of these things are are working for us. Yeah, and I think aspects of, of helping in the workforce in that space is creating those uh, spaces of psychological safety in our work environments to allow that diversity to really shine so that people can be themselves, they can bring their unique experiences to the table and contribute in new ways and help us come up with new innovative ideas that, you know, if you have a, a more homogeneous team, 
you just don't think that way. You don't go into some of those different nuances and different ways of solving problems. And that's discussed quite a bit in a book called The Diversity Bonus by Scott Page, where he talks about how diverse teams economically outperform all other homogeneous teams. And that's gonna be part of our conversation that we'll have tomorrow. Um, continuing on in this sort of similar path, you know, the, as, as the work changes and, and we've sort of described so far about how things have been shifting, there are gonna be a lot of workers that are, are displaced by the, the kind of shift in the workforce needs. Um, we'll need to come up with some sort of support systems, re-education systems. So what should a modernized worker support system look like in order to assist displaced workers and help them adapt into what employers actually need? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with that since it's one of the topics that came up in our report. And I, you know, I'm not sure anyone has a real answer yet. You know, a lot of folks um, look to European models and there are some very interesting European models about worker support systems, the German kind of, you know, sort of the shared work environment, which is actually a lot of companies in Washington are using this sort of shared work. In fact, my own agency is using it. I mean, I'm, I'm technically a furloughed employee, but really the thing is about is, is how do you finance an unemployment system for those that are not traditionally part of it, right? We, we, we you know, our, our modern, our, the workers comp and UI systems of today are a are hundred plus years old now and were built during a time of manufacturing industrial era and that kind of thing. And now we have a whole different ball game with gig workers, people who change, you know, we change jobs and careers a lot more often. And so the financing mechanism has to change. Maybe it means again, higher payroll taxes or, employer contributions maybe it means more from our from individuals um, maybe change we, we change how we finance um, social services uh, I know you're going to have uh, Andrew Yang on and he's going to be a big talker about UBI I'm not a big fan of UBI but I understand the idea behind it and that's the idea that during changes of life significant changes of life where, where income isn't coming in how do you get somebody through to the next level? And, and we haven't quite figured it out, but clearly it's gonna cost money and it's gonna to have to be financed differently than what we've done so far. Um, one thing that's actually on the books in the state of Washington, we talked about lifelong learning. There's actually something called a lifelong learning account that exists in the, uh, in the laws that, that could be activated if we had banks and employers and all that start to contribute to it. So um, no one's quite figured it out. And again, it's going to be a difficult political process because it's going to require new thinking and a change in how we've operated systems that unions might not like, employers might not like, but ultimately we've got to find something that benefits the individual so that we can make it through life without too much disruption. So what it looks like now, I have no idea, but it's, it's going to require change in how we, particularly the financing mechanisms. So I'll, I'll leave with that and see what other folks have to say. I've been, uh, one of the things that I learned uh, through time uh, about some systems, I think it's um, the UK and France, that they have this uh, social system for unemployed people. And the first time that I heard about it, it was very hard to digest. It's like, so I don't have a job and the government give me money. But that's so nice. I, I don't have to look for work then. Supposedly they have to work, uh, look for work, but people know a way around the system and they make money without doing anything. So I kind of didn't like the idea. But then living in my country where there are so much poverty, I realized that basically they're paying those people so that they don't go out and become criminals and start mobbing people. So you're paying for a kind of safety. Now, when I was saying before about the government helping with scholarship, these, the current government here in the States gave away some money recently as a kind of relief for the COVID. And I was very thankful and many other people, it was a lifesaver. But then again, it was just like giving a fish without teaching how to go and fish. So how about instead of just throwing the money, Hell, okay, we're going to teach you and go to a vocational 
training, something that is practical, something that can help people going and start producing or changing. Maybe within that same training, there's some like uh, making your mind more flexible so that you can adapt to changes indirectly somewhere in there. Uh, so that way it becomes an investment for the government, an investment in people. That is actually the, 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 the biggest asset that any nation has instead of um, throwing away the money, instead of making it like a cost only to the economy. So I think, you know, I think both um, Lewis and Carlos make great points about, um, you know, first of all, the models that we have to consider around like the workforce, but then the systems that are already in place to enable those, right? And and how we ebb and flow in and out of those. You know, I think Lewis mentioned gig economics, right? And if you're not familiar with what that is, gig economics is this notion of we've got a specific set of work that may have a, prof, you know, a, a specific start and end date, and then this is the compensation that will be associated with that. Um, and so it's almost a blending of these two to say, we're going to apply sort of this gig economy to this part of our workforce while we can then reinvest some of, you know, um, resources into something and, and then, you know, approaching or making recommendations around saying these systems require this level of input. And so we can we can use the gig economy model here to, you know, incentivize, but also to empower and to, to, to really use these resources to call this point the right way. So it's not just like we're, we're just we're, we're paying you for this. We're actually going to teach you something. We're going to teach you how to fish. You're going to get the skills that you need. And the organizations are adopting a new model that they can lean in and out of, right? We, we talk about, um, you know, being agile in the way that you move. It, there needs to be some consideration for agility in the way that the work actually gets performed, right? You may have awakened a whole different part of the population that's like, I don't, I don't want full time. I want the freedom to be able to kind of move in and out of these experiences, these organizations, these cultures, if it serves them to stay in one place, by all means, maybe there's an opportunity there. But, you know, and again, I'm just using gig economics as a, as a particular model, but that could be something that could very much serve organizations and be able to serve people, right? They can come in and out of it as family needs arise, as personal needs arise, if they want to, you know, stay put and, and allow themselves to be skilled up and be incentivized in that way. Um, but that, to Tansy's earlier point, it goes back to the diversity, right? It goes back to the ability to be inclusive. Um, and it, uh, it, uh, it adds this notion of agility to um, some of that talent development model that we're looking at, which again, plays back into all the things that we've been talking about up to this point in the conversation. So I love that you both brought up both the, the systems around this, but also the approach we need to take about that, because that's a real opportunity. I don't think um, organizations are leveraging fully, and, and there's some there's some good stuff there if we can tap into it. So I would add a couple of points um, somewhat related to COVID. Um, the, the thing that I think that's great about COVID is it's giving an, us an opportunity to rethink systems that are very broken. And the, the two that I would throw out there are healthcare and education. Um, and I, I think one of the, so I used to be um, a, a grant evaluator for federal and state um, grants on education. And one of the things that I discovered is that basically in education, especially in K through 12, basically it doesn't fit anybody. You're either gifted and talented, which means you're not challenged enough. You're the average, which no one is technically the average, or you might be um, special ed and need some additional help. So, so that is not a good system. The thing that I'm excited about, and one of the reasons that I work in technology, um, is that I'm excited about the potential of technology being able to deliver new models of education. So things like Khan Academy, things like self-driven learning, um, this focus on being lifelong learners is a, is a fundamental shift that I think will help um, support this transformation. Do we know what it's gonna look like in the future? Absolutely not. I think we're just at the stage where we're identifying the problem and trying to explore that. But I think one of the things that's gonna be great is how technology can help cater to the individual. Um, it moves away from standardization and more towards personalization. Because again, I think the biggest challenge we have isn't a shortage of knowledge or a shortage of ability, but how do you match those skills and how do you develop them and then connect them to the right opportunities? Yeah, 
you're absolutely right in, in rethinking education. And I think there's a huge opportunity, as you noted, Tansy, in the educational space where we can bring in artificial intelligence as it involves to deliver tailored learning experiences to each individual learner so that they can adapt at their own pace, learn at their own pace, and, and we can handle more things like some people are visual learners, auditory learners, some people read better, and address each person where they're at and help them move forward. Um, I was just looking through Andrew Yang's book again, and um, there's a section in it where he talks a bit about displaced workers, and in particular, people who are simply giving up on the workforce entirely. And so he's he cites a big concern about a growing population of folks who exit the workforce and file for disability. And there's a statistic he has that in 2013, 56% of prime age men, working males, 25 to 54, who were not working, not in the workforce, were receiving disability payments and, and he talks a lot about the disenfranchisement that these folks feel. Um, to, to anyone on the panel, what should we be doing to help keep hope alive in a time of turmoil and uncertainty for many people as in some cases the job market and, and what they've been doing for years and where their expertise is and where their passion is vanishes out from under them? Yeah, you know, Micah, this is a, a, a tough issue, and it's it's almost more cultural and emotional than it is economic, right? And I, and I think this particularly besets, you know, older men, particularly, you know, those who've been using their bodies to make a living for many years. And, you know, and, and I guess, too, since, I mean, pardon me again, so this is this is SPU and and Carlos and I are involved with a, you know, a group called AI and Faith. So I want to maybe bring in a little bit of spirituality here. And, you know, again, this is one where after the last recession, the big 08, 09 recession, workforce participation dropped. And again, that 2013 statistic you cite was, you know, kind of at the depths of, of that. And then right be before the pandemic, we were actually starting to see workforce participation go back up. And in fact, um, I was starting to get data again. This is sort of around future work and recalling data. I mean, even people who were getting out of jail were starting to get jobs as like dishwashers and stuff like that. I mean, so that's like, I mean, things like, I mean, that's maybe not the most ideal situation, but obviously unemployment for, you know, um, those getting out of jail is, you know, really high. So we're starting to see some really encouraging things, or participation, but I don't, I don't have an answer. This is one where I, I you know, I, I start using my faith. I use prayer frankly, on this. I mean, that's not a good public policy response, but it's one that's, it's deeper than just an economic and training thing, right? I mean, this is a cultural thing and I, I don't have an answer because it, it kind of affects, you know, kind of guys like me, if you will. Um, and it's sad to see, I, I, but I don't have an answer. I'm glad you brought it up and I would love to hear what other folks think about it because it's, you know, it's, it's where I think where so much of us, and again, too, I think it affects you know, men in particular is that we put so much of our self-worth into our paycheck and how we earn a living. And, you know, we've got to switch that mindset so that when you lose your job or you're the way you make a living, your whole psyche isn't destroyed. And, you know, that's a hard thing. I, I again, I don't have an answer. I'd love to hear what other people think about it. And I don't know what are the demographics it may be affecting as well too. So anyway, and, you know, it probably is leading to some social unrest too. So it's probably a question we probably need to figure out. So I think, Lewis, you raised a great point, and I want to tie it into something um, that Tansy said around, you know, an area of, that we have an opportunity being education. Because I think she calls great attention to that. Um, and again, a lot of these things are things that we just have to find the intersection between. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with this notion of um, this, this concept called the Medici effect, but it's essentially how do we take two things that are seemingly you know, not the same and, and, and merge them to create something um, that's innovative and new and different. And so um, I think you also raise a good point about culture, right? Um, and, and in my career, I will tell you that I have sat in the seat of both um, 
guiding leaders through understanding a business change is coming and messaging that to the people that are impacted by that. And, you know, as an HR professional, you always think two things. Number one is if ever there was a time to operate in grace and humility, it is now when you are talking about someone's livelihood. And the second part is how do you bring people along this part of the journey to help them see some potential silver lining in what this is. And I think this is also going back to a little bit of what we're talking about before, which is how do we educate um, folks who may be displaced around looking at new models of work. So gig economics, you know, um, really digging into things that are, you know, temp, temp to perm type opportunities, maybe even looking at saying, are you willing to go in and volunteer and offer your expertise in a way or with an industry or with an organization that you may not have considered before, right? And how do we educate employers and organizations to say, this can be a part of your transition model. You need to understand and, and be prepared for the fact that this transition is coming and this is gonna be what the fallout looks like. And the way that you can prepare for that is be ready to put some of these models in place or activate some of these organizational designs that you may not have commonly leaned into to create opportunities, not only for people from your organization, but really open yourself up to, not, to the community to you know, spaces that you may not have played in before that you may have been considering um, opening up to, or how are we getting into you know lower levels of you know education or putting ourselves out there? What how does that impact our branding? And so I think that there's something to be said for really looking at putting some of those systems in place um, and being able to empower organizations to activate them. But there has to be this educational component in there, not only through a system of lifelong learning, but tying it back into the brand of the employer, the, the way that they want to drive their employee culture, and then just understanding their appetite for change, right? I specialize in org design, org strategy, and effectiveness change management. That is my business partner jam, right? If you, if you want to make me happy, talk to me about change, right? I, 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 I take people through that. And one of the things when we get to the sustainability part of change is what's going to happen if we can't sustain the change that we have? Well, then you need to be agile and flexible in thinking about what you're going to do next. And that's part of the change management framework that I build in, which is if this model does not work, then what are we going to do? And what are we prepared to endure? And how are we prepared to work through that? And I think being able to navigate through some of these aspects that are different, new, foreign, create opportunities for us to learn and grow. And, and that comes through education. It comes through a little bit of baptism by fire even, right? And then and, and being able to just say, we've not tried it, but at this point we only stand to gain. And, and really being open to educating yourself in real time a little bit, um, you know, to try to see if you can come up with something that's sustainable for your, for your organization. And that has impact, you know, just, just to the workforce in general. It's really helpful to, to hear Tim, Kim. Um, and as you start talking about education, I wanna try and bring this home for our students as well. I know that uh, employers have been having a difficult time or have said they have a difficult time finding people with the right skill sets for a lot of their open positions. And I, I guess I'd like to ask, do you see a disconnect between skill demand and what educational institutions are focusing on. So when, when we're talking to our students about the world that they're graduating into, what does it look like? What does work look like? What might it look like in a decade? Yes, so I can start, and, and actually, Carlos, I would love your thoughts on this because you, you come from sort of this dual, you know, sort of perspective where, you know, you're in the States, but you've got this global mindset to apply to it because you, you're seeing some of this outside of here. So I would I would invite you to, to certainly speak up after I do. But yes, there is a bit of a disconnect. Um, you know, part of what we look at when we think about generational um, workforces is there are certain traits and attributes that we align to a generation. And as these generations move through the workforce, they start to evolve and change and people get uncomfortable with the new things, right? We talk about millennials and how millennials are just so this and that, but quite frankly, they're not anything that any other generation before them wasn't, right? It just so happens that as generations age, they settle into what those, those things are. And so I think that there has to be um, an openness to being, flexible in saying five years ago, we needed this type of skill set, but what's the evolution 
of that skill set, right? And how are we capturing that in the way that we write job descriptions, in the way that we brand ourselves, in where we go to do this work, in how we are aligning ourselves to the university opportunity, right? Are we plugging into educational institutions where we would not have looked for this talent before? Or are we really leaning into this notion of transferable skills? Meaning can I take someone who has experience in this industry and put them in a completely different space where they can be successful, right? My initial background is in um, corporate health and wellness. Now I've always been a coach. I've always been someone who dealt with confidential information. I've always had to build trust and credibility with relationships as a personal trainer and as a wellness coach. I transitioned that beautifully into human resources. It's the same thing, right? I'm, I'm coaching people on their careers. I'm helping them understand where they can find value. I'm bringing them on the journey and helping them see the, the, the buy-in for getting healthy. There's buy-in for lifelong learning. There's buy-in for education. So it's all there, right? But I needed to recognize that I had the skills to, to be transferable in from one industry into another. And again, I'll go back to Tansy's point around education. Are we educating ourselves enough to do that? Or are we leaning into systems that are there to be able to build that and and you know Carlos please join jump in because I would love to know if, if you're seeing some of this in your own space the way you're counseling students and then what this looks like globally right outside of here well um, you know the problem is we humans are very special and we professors in academia we think that we know it all you know, you go to the old professor and you ask, uh, tell him about a new idea that you come up with and he's going to say, no, that's impossible because I have not researched it and it's not in the literature, so no way. So I think, and this is the, I, in my notes, actually, I, I wrote this because of all the discussion and uh, thanks to Lou, basically, I think that it, it, there is a very, uh, important um, Christian value that we should exercise as universities, as institutions, and it's humility. We should be humble enough to recognize that we don't know. We don't know. We are in this, and like you guys, like you were saying, Kim, before, we are flying in a plane while we're building it. So we have to acknowledge that things change, and we need to keep tapping into the industry because at the end, we are serving society. Our client is not the, the student. I, I never thought that the client was the student. I always thought that the uni, in the university setting, the client is society. And the student actually is the raw product that we're going to make it shine. So uh, the first thing is that, to be humble enough to go and listen, to understand and transmit to the student, look, we are learning together this, let's figure it out. And keep listening, keep an eye on the industry constantly so that they tell you what it is that they need the most. Now, I want to make a point here, and this is something that happened a lot uh, back home again in Honduras, and I heard it a little bit also in Taiwan, is that sometimes company come to the university and say, we want you to teach the students this technology. And I was like, what do you mean you want us to teach that technology? That technology in five years is going to be gone. We don't teach brands. We don't teach what is in right now or famous or what is hot. We teach our students how to learn. We teach under the hood to understand how does it work. So when they come to you and you say, look, we have this new technology we, I want you to produce in this, the student is not afraid. Why? Because we already push them out over the edge to say, you didn't know this? Okay, learn by yourself, but I'm paying you to teach me. No, you're paying me to form you. So I'm going to make you realize that you have enough to learn by yourself. And then when they go to the industry and they, they say, they come up with something new, they say, I'm not afraid. I'll buy a book, two books. As a matter of fact, can you pay me for one of the books? Yes, okay. Two weeks, I am producing. Six months, I'm proficient. Why? Because I learned how to learn. Because I am adaptable, I'm flexible. And that is, that is a skill that it's learned. First, because they push you to, and second, also by example. 
by being humble enough to let them know that you don't know so that they are comfortable enough later to say to the company, they go to the interview and they say, do you know Phoenix++, plus plus, the new programming language and uh, technology with AI and, and sounds and colors and everything? And they say, no, I don't know, but I'm not worried about it. And they can be confident by saying that. So evidently universities, we have been slow to adapt, okay? Because it takes a lot of effort to reinvent curriculum. No, you need to change the curriculum. You have to tell, uh, go convince the professor that they need to update stuff. So it takes a while. So instead of changing the whole content, maybe we should change the way that we are teaching those contents so that we push the students like, you know, you can do it, you can change. This is your superpower as a human, okay, to adapt. So those are my, that, that, that's my opinion on this. Yeah, that's, that's really true, Carlos. Adaptability is one of those key skills. Um, our top Q&A question sort of blends into an aspect of the future of work, which is the rapidly changing technological capabilities and the need for different types of labor, which are shifting very quickly, more quickly than we've historically seen before. What are the most important skills and talents that are needed to thrive in the workforce of tomorrow? And I, I sort of bend this towards Kim and Tansy representing some of our employers. What are you looking for? What do our students need to present to you as their capabilities to, to help their prospects? Yeah, I'd give you the floor, Tansy, go for it. <laughs> okay. um, so, so I would say um, a, a lot of it is understanding who you are and communicating that. Um, and I would, and, and when I think about technology, I think technology as sort of the next leg of the stool. You need to write, you need to read, you need some basic math skills, and you need to have comfort with technology. Now, the great thing is this audience, you already have a step ahead of everybody else. Like it is part of, of your being of who you are. Um, and so I would, I think part of it is having a, tech, a perspective of embrace technology, but that means embrace technology in the way that it makes sense um, for your career um, and use it to support and to supplement you rather than feel like, oh, this, I need to learn how to code or I need to know how to do this. Understand like the, the, this, the language and the skills that you need to pursue the types of areas of interest that you have and be able to communicate those. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting that we're seeing um, when we're talking about, you know, job automation, there's there's a lot of different buckets. Um, and, and the one that I think is probably really most relevant to this audience is this idea of sort of lower level automation of tasks that are in um, sort of a, a, a corporate environment. Um, and and the, the thing that I would say is that actually for this audience, that's a really good thing, because I don't think anybody here would prefer to spend a ton of time doing data entry. And so a lot of the things that are being automated are things that you are not gonna find fulfilling. They're not significant value add to the business. They're not interesting. And so in, in this environment, being able to understand how to work with technology and communicate about technology, those are the types of skills that, that employers are looking for from you. They need to learn that from you. So you understanding sort of what you uniquely bring, you uniquely bring to the table, which is this understanding of technology, of innovation. It's sort of part of your DNA is something that's incredibly valuable. So I think leaning into that, embracing that, knowing how to communicate that and, and sort of understanding the role that you can play going into these environments where they're trying to change, they're trying to innovate. As, an organiza as organizations, they know they will die if they don't learn how to adapt. So if you can sort of help them in that adaption process, whatever your role is, that's something that's of significant value to employers. So I would echo everything Tansy said. Um, I think that that's really sound, solid, um, you know, intentional guidance. To that, I would also add, because um, you know, Tansy made mention of culture in there. And so we know now, when we look at the state of the world, right, and we think about 
this notion of, you know, bringing your whole self to work, right? And um, going back to a little bit of the conversation around diversity and inclusion, right? Um, there is space for it all there, right? And so being open to leveraging your transferable skills to tell your narrative, right? Everybody has a story. Um, and everybody has an idea of where they want to work, how they want to work, um, this notion of live, work, play, right, and what that means. And so how we achieve that, which is really being authentic to who you are and bring, bringing your whole self to work, because that in and of itself is diverse. And it drives the inclusion narrative that organizations need to get their arms around, right? I, I think that being able to look across the things that Tansy was was speaking about, which, you know, you know, the education and being able to, you know, bring all of that together in one space to kind of say, while I don't come from this traditional background, right, let me tell you what I do bring to the table. And let me tell you how I think that can serve your organization. One of the things that I do when I do, um, you know, career strategy coaching is I ask people, what are their values? Right. And I tell people your values are your stability. Right. This is how this is what you believe in. It's what you expect people to give to you. But it's also how the world is going to experience you. So if you value honesty, integrity, accountability, put that out there and lead with that, because that then is going to flow through this ocean of inclusion, which is how you're going to show up on the shore of diversity in these boxes that they're looking for. Right. And then it's going to force them to think a little bit differently to say, I may not have hired somebody who comes from a corporate health and wellness background in human resources, but I see how the marriage is there. That could apply to any one of my fellow panelists here. I'm sure they all, they have their own stories, but I think this notion of being a culture ad, right? We've, we've tried to, we've been so adamant about, you know, are you a culture fit? No, what are you bringing in to the culture, right? We, we know what the culture is, but we need to evolve it. And so how are we looking at the transferable skills? How are we looking at the education and how are we opening ourselves up to being innovated and putting together a lot of these different um, stories that everyone is presented here about that. And, and that's what helps make you unique. Um, but it, it's also what draws you to the type of organization either you really want to be a part of or you may not have considered before because you kind of got to get out of your own comfort zone. We've talked about organizations getting out of their comfort zones, but we may need to get out of our own comfort zones as well. If we, if we come from a legacy of healthcare, of the legal system or whatever it is, right? We, right you, you don't have to be a lawyer to go teach. Right. You, you're, you don't have to be, you know, like I, like I said, I came from one industry, but I had transferable skills in another. Right. And it is a story that I'm proud of. So be open to being prescriptive about your values and, and being able to bring that to the table just as much as you do your experience with one organization or having, you know, a certification that grounds you in this or having something else that affirms you in that. So that's what I would add to what Tansy uh, shared earlier. I would like to add an addition to all that. Uh, very quickly, like summarize, right? Adaptability, lifelong learning. Everybody has said that, lifelong learning. So I remember once that a uh, teacher told me, you need to learn how to unlearn. Because sometimes we get so tight into our own concepts. So we need to be able to be flexible and then throw away stuff and put on some new stuff. Um, and I want to add another one that haven't been mentioned, especially in the age of artificial intelligence. We need to have more ethical thinking too, not just critical think thinking, ethical thinking, okay? Because the AI is called, it's going to go according to what it learns. So it's going to require a lot of help from the human and from the heart, from the soul, from the part that decides what's right and wrong. Okay, and that is like a next level from critical thinking to the ethical thinking. What is good for us as humans, a society, for our world? And an, an, an additional one, and also uh, addressing one of the questions, definitely uh, teamwork has changed uh, by COVID. As far as I know, every company in the last 10 years has been eager, we want uh, professionals coming into our company that are able to work as a team. Now you can add something to work as a team on any medium, together in the same room, away in a different room, with people in another time zone, with people with a different culture, 
and I, I'm going to tell you that even though this technology seems to have pulled us apart, something incredible happened last quarter that I was teaching. My students told me that they felt closer together on Zoom with doing the breakout sessions and the activities that they felt inside the classroom when they were next to each other. And I was like, wow, so this can happen. So connections can still happen even through virtual world, but we need to be open to them. So uh, summarizing again, adaptability, lifelong learning, critical thinking, ethical thinking, and teamwork over any medium. Thanks, Carlos. You know, I, I think something else that I've heard loud and clear is that demand for the hybrid skill set, where it's not just being able to do or having a degree in art or psychology or biology, but it's having one of those paired with the ability to do programming or statistics or data analysis, but also primarily having human skill sets, the ability to humanize your work and to engage with others, that is becoming more and more uh, important. Um, and in particular, Yang also talks about this and might mention it in his talk tomorrow about what he calls the new caring economy. Um, as, as we sort of run out of time here, I, I would like to wrap up by asking you all just to, to chime in with a, a single thought on how you believe that the fourth industrial revolution might bring around or bring about a new sort of digital renaissance where people are freed up from repetitive tasks and can refocus on arts and philosophy, how that might bring broader equity, how it might bring the world closer together. Why don't we start with Lewis? In other words, how do, how, how do we make liberal arts great again? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> You know, it's a great question, Micah, and, and thanks. You know, again, it's one of those that that it's going to require intentionality, right? I mean, if left to our own devices, you know, you know, the world will use us up. And so, you know, advanced technology, artificial intelligence, and all these things, if we are intentional about the use in service of humanity, then we have a shot. If we are unintentional and we are non-human and we are non-ethical, then the world will eat us up and, and that promise or eventuality will not make it. So this is a time to use the technology that we have built to increase our humanness so that again, so that we can work the 30 hour uh, work week, still make a good living and be able to pursue you know, our higher selves, you know, uh, in, in a free and secure society. So, but it, it requires all of us thinking differently, using technology to improve ourselves, and again, being intentional and more human. But it's going to be hard work, but it could be really fun and interesting uh, on the way there. And I'm looking forward to being part of it. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Lewis. Carlos? Yeah. Uh, I think that Again, this is not a technology problem. There is a very deep human problem. And once again, coming from an education background, I think that education is key in all these things. Uh, to be able to reach that digital renaissance and a good democracy, as a matter of fact also, we need a very well-educated population. That way, people will be able to take advantage of this technology, okay? And like uh, Lou was uh, saying before, there will be intentionality of using it for us, okay? Not to be used by it, okay? So once we are educated, we're going to value the work because we like to do it, not because we're forced to, we're going to choose to work and maybe since technology is going to be taking care of a lot of the basic necessities, then we're going to have chance to explore the arts and philosophy that many people did not pursue because they had to eat. So there are many, many artists that ended up doing something else because they, they couldn't buy their food or sustain their family just by doing their art. 
So I, I, I really, really, really look forward for this uh, time in history when we are freed up to find these, at the moment, not considered very profitable careers. So, yes. Thank you, Carlos. Kim? I would say that what really serves us is sort of reversing the way that we've been thinking it, right? The technology has been evolving and we're trying to keep up as opposed to saying, this is what the culture requires and here are the boundaries that we need to put in place and let's help the, let's, let, let's allow the technology to drive us in that direction and support us in advancement of that and um, allowing the technology to be in service of the advancement of the culture and the innovative you know, approaches we need to take at thinking through things or you know, how we wanna change things as opposed to changing it and then trying to manipulate the technology to sort of catch up to where we are. Very true, thank you, Kim. And uh, Tansy. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is as we move towards automation, as machines take over a lot of the standardized work, what becomes the competitive advantage for people is what makes us human. So being subjective, being emotional, and, and those are things where, where technology falls short and we need more of that. So our competitive advantage is to actually explore these things, the philosophy, the creativity that in the past has sort of taken a backseat. So that's something I personally am really excited about. Um, the, the other thing I would say is think of technology as an enabler. I, I think there was a there was a comment a little bit earlier saying you need to be interdisciplinary, not just have a liberal arts background, but also make sure you can code and do these other things. I think about that slightly differently. I there are things I'm not strong at. Like I, I wouldn't be a strong coder. I wasn't great at statistics. I use technology to help me compensate for my weaknesses. And so rather than being overwhelmed saying there's all these other things I need to learn, like there's a reason I went into liberal arts because I'm not good at that. Like know what your strengths are and use technology to help supplement the areas that you're not great at. Um, and so I think that's that's really the approach that you wanna take because you do wanna have these different skill sets, but I think the way that you approach it is very different. Um, and lastly, I just wanna throw this in there as a, as a bit of a practical piece of advice. Um, technology can connect us in a way that it never has been able to in the past. And, and to be specific, LinkedIn can do that. Um, and one of the things that I love about sort of this mentality that's within Silicon Valley and I feel is sort of permeating within the world is this um, openness to connecting around different things. So I would invite you reach out to people you want to have conversations with on LinkedIn. Like, you know, if you're trying to find um, the best place for you within a company, have conversations, say, hey, like, this is where I'm at. Can we please talk? So sometimes using technology to do something that's analog is, is the best combination. And so that's something that I would really recommend is be open to having these conversations because you'll be surprised how many professionals would love to share their expertise or their background um, or help provide guidance. Thank you, Tansy, very well said. Um, we are at time. I'd like to thank all of you, uh, Lewis, Carlos, Kim, Tansy, thank you so much for your time today and for your insights as we continue to have these conversations throughout the week. Um, thanks to our event team who made all of this possible, Marty, Madison, Taylor, and Dr. Radine Copeland. I'd like to invite you all to Thursday's session on the impact of sociopolitical disruption in diverse populations from 1030 to 1130. And also to join us on Friday as we hear from former, Vice Pres former presidential candidate, Andrew Yang on the future of work. Thank you so much for participating in our conversation today. Thank you folks, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It was great. It was a pleasure.